Welcome to Arise Conversations with Joan. My name is Joan Wosu and I'm the award-winning author of the book, I Rise, The 10 Secrets to Getting Up When Life Knocks You Down. So today we're going to be talking about a dream. It always starts off with a dream, the desire to create a business and become an entrepreneur, the idea of building a business and creating impact. Yeah, you need that. That's usually the initial drive you need to get started. But when it comes to building a successful profitable and sustainable business, it takes a little bit more than that. In the early days when it's just you, it's fine, you're everything. But as the business starts to grow, you need to ensure that you do have the right strategies, but not just the strategies, you also need the right culture in place to enable your team to perform at their best and also to deliver products that your customers truly desire and want. So whether you're just starting out or whether you're a seasoned business, doesn't matter. You cannot escape these two pillars. You need them to ensure that you have that long-term growth that you desire for your business. Our guest today is Warren Cochran. He helps principled entrepreneurs build a business that matters. That is one that delivers the owner attractive profits and a fulfilling lifestyle while also creating positive impacts on customers, teams, and the larger community. He's been helping entrepreneurs since 2002. His clients have experienced everything from eight-figure exits to seven-figure salaries, from rapid expansion to minimize operational work because of the development of great leaders and high-performance value-driven cultures. He is also a recovering lawyer. I love that. A serial (laughs) entrepreneur, a college professor, a presentation slash pitch trainer. He's an actor. Don't ask me. He'll tell us more. Also a theater director. And of course, most importantly, he's a dad to a wonderful daughter who constantly challenges him to be a better person. Warren believes that we all have far more potential than we believe or use. And he loves helping bring that potential to life and helping you create a happier and fulfilled life. Welcome, Warren, to the show. Thank you very much. That was a very warm introduction. It's nice to be here. Awesome. So too many questions. I'm just ready to to get going. So let's start from the beginning. So tell us, take us back to your journey. How did you start your career and how did you get to where you are today? Uh, (laughs) So it's, it's kind of weird to have an answer like that that starts at birth. But in my case, it's actually relevant because when I was born, I was supposed to die. I was the second person in history to live through this really weird congenital defect. They told my parents I had zero chance of survival, but they were going to do this experimental surgery and it worked. Um, And so when I found out about that, I kind of had this sense that I got to do something with this gift I wasn't supposed to have. Mm. And so all those weird incarnations that I've been through were sort of in search of what is that thing? You know, so I started thinking, okay, I'm going to go into politics you know, try to help the country and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, so I went into law school because that was the route and I hung out with people in the political game and I kind of went, that just doesn't sit right. (laughs) So then I went into law and then, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather make a pie than fight over a pie. Mm -hmm. Uh, So then from there I went into, I I did a few things. I went into entrepreneurship and professorship sort of at the same time uh, and did some acting and theater directing, you know, trying to transform the transformative power of art Uh, But really, people didn't leave my plays going out and changing their lives. Uh, So it was really in entrepreneurship that it really started to sing to me that I went, wow, no, entrepreneurship is, in my view, one of the most powerful forces for positive social change. You know, because people, what do do entrepreneurs do? They solve problems, right? They actually see a problem in the world and they're trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, the culture we live in, all the green technologies that are coming in, um, all of that was is the result of the entrepreneurial spirit. And so that's where I thought, no, this is where I want to play. So I became an entrepreneur. And then as things went along, we actually, I was, had a business that got really badly hurt during the dot bust era, you know, back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And it was, uh, it was tough, you know, but we got through it. And then I thought, well, you know what, one of, One of my partners, he wanted to buy the rest of us out. So we went, okay. So I I sold the business and then went, okay, so what's next? And I thought, well, there's a lot of other entrepreneurs who have probably been through tough times. And then a family friend 
was doing this weird thing called business coaching. I'd never heard of it before. And she told me about it. And I went, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And I talked to friends and family and they were like, oh my God, that's perfect for you. Uh, and so that's what I jumped into. And it's been 20 years since then. And I haven't looked back because I, you know, I think there's a, there's a great line in the play Rent that says the opposite of war is not peace, it is creation. Hmm. And, you know, what entrepreneurs do is they create. And so I thought, well, it, if it matters that you do it, then it matters that you do it well. And so if I can help entrepreneurs do it better, then it's going to help make the world a better place. So that's the, <laughs> that's, that, that's a life's journey in a couple of minutes. <laughs> that is a life's journey. And, you know, it's so interesting how I always, my life was also a lot of uh, turns, you know, bumps and all of that great stuff. I also had a, I was born very premature, about six and a half uh, months, and I didn't think I was going to survive as well. So pretty much a similar story, but I never linked it to all the things I've done. So I find it so fascinating that, you know, all your stories, everything, now that I'm looking back and you're telling the story, it's all connected. Like everything you've been through was leading you to this point, And your purpose has probably been the same all through. Mm -hmm. I think that's really something a lot of people really do struggle with where it's like, oh, I, I want to do this. I want to do it in a certain way. Or why is my, why am I so confused about life? Why am I switching the jobs or careers? I can't figure things out. Why, why I created this business. I loved it so much. And then it went bust. There's a reason it's leading you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just trust the process. Just keep going with it and you will find what your true purpose is. So that, that's you know, it's interesting on that. I've actually done this exercise with people where I'll say on the left side of a page, write down all the awful things that have happened in your life that you hate. And then on the right side, write all the great things that have happened in your life. And then identify the things on the right side that could possibly have happened without the things on the left side having happened. And there's not many usually. So I, I use this line, a, a client of mine joked to me about, about it the other day because I've used it with them so many times mm -hmm. that sometimes our greatest gifts come in really ugly wrapping paper. That is true. That is true. A lot of, yeah, that is true. Your purpose, you usually find it through the pain. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So you're doing an amazing job. You've been helping entrepreneurs since 2002. Um, you talk about, when I was reading your paper, you talked about you know, profit with principle. You want to help them profit, but with principle, mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means kind of doing it the right way. You know, like I, at a sort of philosophical level, I think there's a, there's a vacuum of moral leadership right now. Like people don't know who to go to for ethical and moral guidance. And, you know, the political leadership doesn't really hold itself out that way. Now people have lost faith in a lot of other institutions. Um, so they look to leadership for the workplace. Yeah. And so I think that puts a responsibility on entrepreneurial leaders to do things in a way that's values aligned and do it the right way. And there's, there's sort of this narrative that is a, a rationalization narrative that, oh, it's just business, or you have to do it because other people do it that way. But that just, that's just a race to the bottom. But when you hold yourself to higher standards, you elevate everybody else around you. You know, and when you, when, you, know, when you said, what's that? through line all the way through my life. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. When I was in elementary school, I was drawing pictures and stuff about, and I was, I was actually engaging in a, in a child's version of moral philosophy. Like I've just always been interested in that. I had a buddy that we would, we were talking Watergate. I mean, I'm, I'm almost 60. I'm 50. I'll be 59 this year. Um, and so I was in elementary school and my buddy and I were like talking about Watergate and the morality of leadership and stuff when we were in elementary school. So it's kind of just been this thing that has been part of my life all the way along. And so when I got into entrepreneurship, I thought, well, if, if entrepreneurship is about making the world a better place, you can't make the world a better place by, by sort of betraying your values and ethics. Right. And so then I took it a little bit further and went, you know, if you look at Steph Curry, if you look at, you know, Wayne Gretzky, I grew up in Edmonton during the heyday of the Edmonton Oilers. Mm -hmm. The greats don't cheat. Right. And why? Because they're so damn good. They're never tempted to. And so that's basically why I do business coaching. Mm -hmm. If You can learn to do business really, really well. You will never be, you won't have to make those little ethical compromises because, oh my God, the pressure is out there. You can just, no, I know what to do. Right. And so I can make strategic, competent decisions 
for my business without ever having to sacrifice my values. And the irony of it all is when you actually run your business by your values, you're happier. Like the, the money, you know, the money is money. But <laughs> if you if you feel like you're kind of soiled, like you're just, your hands are not clean, you just don't feel good about yourself. But when you run your business in a way that's aligned with your values, you just feel great <laughs> yeah. about what you've done. And other people, like you earn the respect of others, you get self-respect, you can sleep at night. Um, and <laughs> I actually believe long-term, your business will be more successful. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more because, and business is one, but even in life in general, you know, I believe in really identifying what your core values are and just making mm-hmm. sure you're always in alignment. It just makes life easier. You take yeah. the load off. You, you show up as your authentic self every single time. And it's just fun. You know, you you don't, to- there's a thing inside, whether it's your conscience, or your soul, whatever you want to call it. It just, it knows. Yeah. You can rationalize it all you want, but deep inside, you know, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then it just feels like, oh, uh, that wasn't, that wasn't the right thing to do. A yucky feeling. <laughs> so speaking about yucky feeling, you know, because I've worked with a lot of uh, big, small, maybe different organizations and you know, some organizations is so, like you said, it's all about business. They don't care too much about culture. They're like, ah, culture, right? Yeah, some, some, we have a sign on the wall that tells us what our culture <laughs> is. That's our culture. <laughs> so what, what is culture and why, why does it matter? Because we're talking about building, you know, the right leaders doing the right thing. What is culture? So um, I'll give you my sort of operating definition. You can talk about culture in lots of different ways. And, it, and it, you know, the short version is just culture is the way people behave and what they value in the workplace. And at a, at a practical, like sort of how do you build this kind of approach? My definition of culture is the behaviors, the incentives, the sim- systems, and the signals that reveal the values of the organization. And each of those has an important element to it. And you say like it, People will like the, the reverse of it, what you just said, having something on the wall. If you looked at Enron's values, like they were carved into the stone of the building and they were, you know, it was integrity and excellence or something like that, you know, beautiful sounding values, but obviously not lived. Right. And so values are not, you know, if you say you value health and then you sit in front of the TV for four hours a night eating Doritos you don't really value health. You might want to value health, but in fact, you don't. And so when you look at what's going on in organizations, you look at the behaviors. So if people say we're team, but then everybody functions in their silos, Mm -hmm. then no, you don't actually, you don't actually value team, you know? And then there's the systems. So perfect example of this, I had a client, a construction company and true, like I, I knew the owner very well, in her soul, she valued safety super high. Like she cared about her people very much. But her systems were the only thing the foreman had to submit every week were productivity reports. And then incentives, the project managers were compensated on productivity targets. There was no incentive based on safety. There were no systems based on safety. So in the middle of a snowstorm, what is everything about the organization structure telling people is most important? Productivity or safety? Productivity. Productivity. Even though in truth, they, they wanted to value safety, they set it up in a way that it wasn't. So culture is way more than just kumbaya and we want to do good in the world and that kind of stuff like it's actually pretty badass like you've got to be really thoughtful about how you do business and what it produces in people you know because people will follow the incentives they'll follow the systems and then the signals are you know if you say we're all about ethics we're all about doing business the right way and then you have a salesperson who brings in three million a year but treats everybody like crap and you let that person continue with that you're really saying you value money more than anything else. Yeah. And people will go, Oh, or the person who gets to have lunch with the president, you know, they're a sycophant, you know, and you say you want equal treatment. Mm. Eh, You're signaling something different than that. Mm. And so it really requires a lot of thought and intentionality to build, to build a culture. Right. So that's the definition in terms of why it matters. (laughs) Tons of reasons why it matters at its core. I think at a selfish level, 
from the business owner standpoint, it just makes your life easier. You know, and I, I use the term high performance culture. So there are people who build quote, nice cultures. And I, I had a client who did that and it was all giving. She just, she was such a beautiful person and she just gave, gave, gave all the time. But when things got, everybody just jumped off the ship, like rats jumping off the sinking ship when things got tough. And it was like, she was so hurt. And part of it was like, there wasn't an expectation of reciprocation, right? And so culture is not just you, the leader being nice and buying foosball tables and letting people have Friday afternoons off. A high performance culture is one where, let me put it this way. If, if you, if you, are you, did you play sports? No, any. <laughs> okay. But for for any listeners who do play sports, one of the things like when you like to play, no one wants to be on the line with the slacker. No. <laughs> right. Because it's no fun, right? You want to be on a line with people who are really giving it. Or, you know, if you're in arts, like in theater, you don't want to be on stage with a person who forgets their lines, right? It just makes life not fun. Mm -hmm. And so when you are with high performers, everybody likes it more. This is the irony, right? Like everything, oh, people want to be slack. No, they don't. They want to be challenged. And when you've got a group of people around you who are all kind of pushing each other a little bit to do good, everybody's motivated. And so productivity goes up. You don't have to manage people as much because they're problem solvers. Clients are happy because they're being well-served. You don't have to recruit as much because you got to have higher employee retention. Your profit's higher because people are more productive and it's just more fun. You know, so that's, those are the reasons really why it matters.